There we go. All right. What's up, my friends? How's it going today? <clears throat> get all cozy. Get all centered. Sit up here and make an evening video. I got my cup of coffee here. It's perfect. Evening coffees always are perfect. <sighs> today, you know, I've had a couple interesting things on my mind today, at least interesting to me, you know, for what it's worth. I thought maybe I'd make this video about binaural beats, um, but I'll probably end up rambling about a few different things, because uh, this is a subject that's fascinated me for a while now, but I kind of left, uh, <laughs> I just say I, I left it alone for a little while. A few years back I was really fascinated with uh, Sulfagio tones, uh, various frequencies, Chaldney plates, which are those plates that vibrate sand, where if you go look you'll see them at certain frequencies, they'll create patterns, and they call them cymat call it cymatics. I got my own speaker out, and I have this, uh, this enclosed speaker with a, uh, another platform built over it with sides, so I can put sand in there and vibrate it, but also I use magnetic sand. Um, there's some really interesting things that you can do with cymatics, even with a pretty, you know, cheap budget. You can download, like, a, you know, a frequency program for your device and pump out whatever hurt, however many hertz you want, you know. And um, <clears throat> during my search through these interesting tones and sounds, my, my goal, my end, I guess the reason why I was fascinated was obvious. I mean, it should be obvious to anyone because everything is vibration. Um, I think it was Nikola Tesla that said, uh, you know, if only you could grasp, you know, that everything is a vibration and you'd have the key to the universe, or was that what it was? No, that was, sorry, a different quote. He said, if only you could grasp the power of three, six, and nine, you'd have the key to the universe. But he also said that uh, something about vibration, I can't remember the quote. Many great philosophers, mystics, as well as scientists, engineers have all agreed that vibration and frequency, it plays a huge role. Now that word is abused in today's world. Uh, there's kind of a new age movement that uses frequency to say, well, you need to raise your vibration. And I would say, well, what does that mean exactly? And can you measure this? Because I believe that the body resonates at the Schumann, hertz, uh, Schumann frequency, which I think is like, what, uh, 7.2 or 7.4 hertz, I believe. But that our hearts and our minds, they all resonate at their own frequencies. The interesting thing about the mind is that it resonates at two fre well multiple frequencies, but the different hemispheres of your brain actually <laughs> operate differently, and it has to do with the rate at which the electrons are passed through the neural network, and I can't remember the specifics of how that works. Um, I'm going to read a little bit of information here because I think that it will shed a little bit of light on this. Uh, beyond the sulfagia or binaural beats, um, into the realms of multiple frequencies. And here's the thing, I believe that this is really the key to understanding how to use things like frequency for medicine or, you know, for healing, these things, kinds of things, as well as for concentration, for sleep, all this has to do with multiple frequencies. Because nature's set up to where everything is in its parts. And since frequencies or vibrational rates are so common everywhere, that there can be frequency sweeps in an earthquake or a variety of different, you know, natural occurrences, that in order to really get a strong, impactful, uh, something that, that can actually be used, you would think, say, for levitating stone or whatnot, you know, a lot of people believe the Egyptians levitated stone using frequencies. Um, I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to get into that one, but... These are some pretty fascinating things. This is why, you know, in Tibetan rituals, in, uh, you know, <laughs> uh, this is a, a Tibetan singing bowl. And you hit it. And then you just rotate the mallet around the edge, and it, what it does is resonates at a certain frequency. Now, we've played with these in groups of three, and in small, like, enclosures. I've tried it in the bathroom, and you can find certain places where the frequency really resonates. And anybody who has, a, say, a subwoofer in their house knows that placement is everything. You might walk to one corner of your house and you might pick up on it really strongly in a place where ordinarily you wouldn't even think you'd get bass, but it's the way that sound carries. Um, and so here's the idea behind these binaural beats is that 
you can actually program your mind to uh, focus better or to sleep better, let's say. Um, and I'll explain how that works through the scientific jargon because I could sit here and talk about it all day and that's not going to explain anything. Research supports the theory that different frequencies presented to each ear through stereo headphones create a different tone, a difference tone, or binaural beat, as the brain puts together the two tones it actually hears. Through EEG monitoring, the difference, to the difference tone is identified by a change in electrical pattern produced by the brain. For example, frequencies of 200 hertz and 210 hertz produce a binaural beat frequency of 10 hertz. Monitoring of the brain's activity, the EEG, shows that the brain produces an increased 10 hertz activity with equal frequency and amplitude of the waveforms in both hemispheres. Research by Dr. Lester Femi, doctor of Princeton Behavioral Medicine and Biofeedback Clinic, and perhaps the foremost authority on the hemispheric synchronization in the brain, also confirms that hemispheric synchronization and the brain entrainment can be induced by binaural beats says there's a revolution going on. There used to be two systems of knowledge, hard science, chemistry, physics, and biophysics, on the other hand, and on the other, a system of knowledge that included ethology, psychology, and psychiatry. And now it's as if a lightning bolt had connected the two. It's all one system, neuroscience. The present era in neuroscience is comparable to the time when Louis Pasteur first found out that germs cause disease. Now I'm skipping through and I'm going to try to get to some of the, you know, the important factors here. Uh, Centerpoint Research Institute currently uses a sound technology called Holosync to entrain brainwave patterns, giving us the ability to influence or create tranquility, pain control, creativity, euphoria, excitement, focused attention, relief from stress, enhanced learning ability, enhanced problem-solving ability, increased memory, accelerated healing, and behavior modification and improvements in mental and emotional health. According to Hutchinson, these scientists' first findings were that those peak states are not mysterious and unpredictable phenomena, but are clearly linked to specific patterns of brain activity. These patterns include the dramatic change in brain wave activity, hemispheric symmetry, and rapid alterations in the levels of various neurochemicals. If we could learn to produce those patterns of brain activity, they reasoned, we should be able to produce the peak states they are associated with. They found that by using types of mechanical stimulation, such as pre precise combinations of pulsating sound waves, they could actually produce those same peak state brain patterns in ordinary people. So we've got the scientific research here to show that brains are actually altered by using this um, and using these particular frequencies and it's pretty amazing here. Um, other scientists have noted that these slower brain wave patterns are accompanied by deep tranquility, flashes of creative insight, euphoria, intensely focused attention, in, in intensely focused attention and enhanced learning abilities. Um, one of okay, let's see. One of the observed effects of this type of sound-induced brain synchronization is increased learning ability. What is now known as super learning began in the 60s and 70s with the work of Bulgarian psychiatrist Georgi Lazanov or Lazanov. Lazanov used deep relaxation combined with synchronized rhythms in the brain to cause students to produce alpha waves. He found that uh, he found that students when in this state learned over five times as much information with less study time per day, with greater long-term retention, in some cases as much as 30 times as much was learned. Now I don't know, of course, the specifics on this, and 30 times more learning sounds like a pretty fantastic amount, but let's just say you even double your learning capacity. And, like for example, I'm taking nootropics right now, and while you're taking these, the whole idea is to enhance your cognitive ability, your ability to speak faster, to think faster, to type faster, to do things at a better accelerated rate, but focused and clear and calm, rather than being jittery or chaotic or drugged up. Now, these combined with the proper alpha waves, the proper brain waves that you might need, um, who knows, what, you know, what are the limits on this? And uh, I'll get into my specific interests in it in a little bit here. I'm just going to see if there's anything else. Um, okay. Scientists have long dis have discovered for memories to form, the brain must undergo a process called long-term potentiation, involving electrical and chemical changes in the neurons associated with memory. Without LTP, incoming for information is not stored, but rather quickly and totally forgotten. 
Neurophysiologist Gary Lynch and associates at the University of California at Irvine discovered that the key to LTP is the theta brainwave pattern. We have found that the magic rhythm that makes up LTP, there's a magic rhythm, a theta rhythm. According to Lynch, this is the natural rhythm of the hippocampus, the part of the brain essential for the formation and storage of new memories and the recall of old memories. The increased production of these different neurochemicals can greatly enhance memory and learning. A research team at the Veterans Administration Hospital in Palo Alto found that a group of normal human subjects, when given substances that increased acetylcholine production in the brain, showed great improvement in long-term memory. While at MIT, students taking acetylcholine enhancers experienced improved memory and increased ability to learn a list of words. Henry noted that acetylcholine is essential to such higher mental processes as learning and memory. Recent studies, okay, here we go, blah, 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 get to the binaural part, see if there's anything left, I'm on the last page here, yes, 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 scientists have also found that the endorphins released when the brain is exposed to alpha and theta binaural beat patterns enhance many mental functions. Endorphins have a powerful strengthening effect on learning and memory, for instance, and have been known to reverse amnesia. Researcher David Wide found that rats injected with endorphins remembered things longer. Dr. Andrew Shally, 1977 winner of the Nobel Prize for Medicine, found that rats receiving injections of endorphins showed improved maze running abilities. Why do endorphins increase learning and memory? Scientists believe that in humans, the place in the brain that produce the most endorphins and contain the greatest concentration of endorphin receptors are the same areas of the brain involved most intimately with learning and memory. Pretty interesting. The evidence clearly shows that brain reward pathways play an important role in learning and memory. And I've speculated that the pathways of brain reward may, f may function as the pathways of memory, consolid memory consolidation. By this, I mean that when something is learned, activity in the brain, reward pathways, uh, facilitates the formation of memory. Evidence for the reward effects of localized electrical stimulation and for the association of reward paths with memory formation indicates that the neural substrates <laughs> of self-stimulation play a vital role in the guidance of behavior. It's going to sound like, you know, uh, sound like jumbled by the time I ramble off some of this stuff. I just copied a few of these things, but um, yeah. With the creation of new neural pathways, connections are perceived between bits of information that previously seemed unrelated, and more choices are available. Herein lies the theoretical explanation for the amazing personality changes that researchers have reported in subjects using sound technology similar to Holosync to change brainwave patterns. So, enough, uh, enough of the science there. Um, what has my experience been? I found that uh, I've only spent, you know, limited amounts of time with binaural beats. But I wasn't at a point where I really wanted to even experiment with it. I think that now I'm at a much more balanced state where I could actually benefit from it. The reason why I stepped away for a while is because I was really interested in the solfagio tones, and people have asked me about that. And they're supposed to be the sacred frequencies, the sacred, you know, tones. And supposedly, some of the stories go that this is the the Gregorian chants were done in these sacred tones, and that they were lost to time. And some people even say, in the modern world, the conspiracy is that, you know. Uh, the Illuminati wanted people to be down, and so they lowered the frequencies, changed the frequencies into 440 hertz, let's say, instead of 444, and that now we're living in this, you know, unmusical world. Um, but when I studied the solfagio tones, and I started asking myself, you know, why 444 hertz? I mean, it's a beautiful number, a spiritual number, right? Well, hertz are just cycles per second. So 444 hertz is merely a man-made construct. So, and, and hertz came well after these Gregorian chants. So in my belief that the solfagio tones, whatever sacred tones are out there, I don't know whether they're the correct ones or not. I think that more research needs to be done on this. My belief is that by using the Chaldney plates to see which frequencies actually cause the sand to arrange in certain patterns, one can learn a lot about how it might affect the human body. Because if it's doing that to sand, I mean, what does that mean? That means that, that, you know, that sound can organize itself into structure. And I even take it as far sometimes as to think that maybe our bodies are like, um, you know, constantly receiving these... 
these exterior signals or whatnot from the universe and uh, that maybe even DNA itself and life itself is created by some sort of unknown uh, vibrational frequency. You know, I, I just, uh, I wouldn't say it's the, the, the same frequency that we would, like, it's not sound waves, you see, these are, they're energies, they're pulsations, it could be in light, I, yeah, I don't know, but. Anyway, enough rambling about that. I gotta go now. I'm gonna do some stuff. So, I guess I'll um, 